I want to help people understand the Northern Lights. I'm Tom Kurz. I'm an astronomer. It's on everyone's bucket list for a reason. The level of emotional effect that the lights have on people. And I feel it too. At night time, anything can happen. So what exactly is a Chief Aurora Chaser? I'm here with Tom Kurz, who is the world's first Chief Aurora Chaser for Hurtigruten, to find out what goes into one of the most interesting jobs I've ever heard of. Simple question, Tom. What do you do? What is a Chief Aurora Chaser? Well, in truth, Hurtigruten is kind of creating the rules here, because uh, this is the very first appointment of a Chief Aurora Chaser. Uh, so in my role, I want to help people understand the Northern Lights and really to make the most of their experience traveling to see the Northern Lights. It's on everyone's bucket list for a reason. Um, it seems to me that Chief Aurora Chaser should be something that lots of people should be doing given how uh, important seeing the Northern Lights are to most people. Um, so I'm an Aurora expert. I have a very long history of Aurora chasing um, and with those expertise I'm working with Hertigruten to ensure that everybody that comes to see the lights has the most extraordinary experience, that that bucket list is well and truly ticked off. I actually think there's more to it though. I think it's easy to see the Northern Lights as something that you just do once, but most people actually, they get the bug. They want to do it again. So we also want to help them make the Northern Lights a part of their lives, to, to enrich that experience in such a way that they maybe think of themselves as Aurora Chasers as well. Anyone can do it. And my goal is to, to try and help people enter that world. And how does one qualify for a job like this? What type of background do you have to have? We're going to find out in the future. As the first Chief Aurora Chaser, I can tell you about my own journey. My background uh, was in astrophysics, worked as an astronomer for many years, uh, fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, and I've always had a strong passion for everything to do with space. Um, but at the heart of that was the experiential side. Stargazing for me has always been one of my favourite hobbies. Um, I think probably the most important thing for being something like a Chief Aurora Chaser is to have a real passion, not just for the science of the Northern Lights, but the experience as well. For me as well, I, I, I find it a deeply emotional experience just to be around people um, and to see their reactions. I feel like I relive it for the first time whenever I'm with someone who's experiencing it for the first time. I assume no day to day of this job is the same, so specifically can you tell me what does a day look like start to finish when you are chasing Aurora on board one of Hurtigruten's ships? The first thing is if you're like me and you're up all night, you get up quite late. You might, yeah. you might miss breakfast, yeah. but uh, you will eventually liaise with those passengers who take that special interest uh, in the astronomy and the Northern Lights. And as the evening starts to draw in, that's when we begin to look in granular detail at what we can expect that night. So we're following data, we're forecasting, we're looking at the weather, we're looking at the position of the ship, we're looking at highlights of the landscape that will be worth looking out for, and we're trying to get everybody ready and inspired, managing their expectations as best we can, and then ultimately, at night time, anything can happen. Because if it's exploding and it's absolutely incredible, quite often the plan falls apart and people are just running around experiencing it and it becomes much more emotional than technical at that point. Can you tell us a little bit about the tools and knowledge that you use to sort of forecast auras and tell if it's going to be a good night for chasing them? Yes, I can. So the first thing to understand is the weather. Now because we're on a ship, the weather is always changing. Fortunately, no one knows the coast like Hurtigruten. We know exactly where we're going to be. And one of the beautiful things about the Norwegian coast is that the weather is so changeable, clear skies are sort of inevitable. So firstly we're looking at the conditions that night and then once we have some feeling of how good the weather is going to be we start to look at what's going to happen with the northern lights. Now when it comes to major storms that occur mm -hmm. we often have a few days warning so we're able to start thinking a few days ahead but on any given night we can forecast auroras with some level of, of confidence maybe 30 or 40 minutes ahead. Mm -hmm. And we're very fortunate now to live in a time when we have that quite sophisticated aurora forecasting data coming in from satellites. So I'm always monitoring that data. It's a little bit graph heavy. It's not the most easy to interpret, but I'm generally keeping an eye on that and trying to figure out you know, when things are really gonna start to happen and then making sure that people are well prepared ahead of time so that they will be ready to go out before it happens and they won't miss a moment of it. Uh, so it's all just about sort of using the tools available to you, the data, keeping an eye on it, 
um, and really understanding from experience how that data translates into what we see in the sky. So I do have the benefit of seeing many hundreds of sightings of the Northern Lights and understanding what the data was, looked like and what the actual outcome was and trying to use that to give people some estimation of, of how likely it is to be that, that good. Sounds like it allows people to stay in a space of anticipation and excitement throughout the day and you get to do all the heavy lift, lifting on the numbers and the graphs and things like that. Yes, exactly. I mean, my job is to make it easy for everyone else. So yes, doing, doing that sort of legwork is, is important. Um, of course, sometimes things happen and, and you're not aware of it. So um, yes, there's, there's, an, there's a whole element of the chase as well, which is not necessarily seeing the aurora, but the chase is exciting and I, and I actually encourage people to do that because if you want to step into the shoes of an aurora chaser there are great nights and there are not so good nights and you sort of need to experience both of them to to know what that feels like to fully appreciate it that's right yeah so when you're on the hunt for the aurora what's going through your mind what does it feel like it feels the same every time actually okay. um, which is strange because you would think after seeing it hundreds of times mm -hmm. that you might start to feel a bit blasé about it but that doesn't happen and one of the reasons for that is that the aurora offers a promise that's very unique in the sky and that promise is that you don't know if you've seen the best display that you're going to see. Mm -hmm. All you know is that you don't want to miss that. So it could well be on any given night that you're about to see the most extraordinary display of your life. So you really have to show up and it feels the same every time. That first glimpse is always very exciting. That's when everybody starts to get excited and they're all facing the same way and then when some activity starts to develop that's when anything could happen there, there is just a real sense of potential mm. that you don't really get with other events in the sky and um, for that reason it always feels kind of like the first time there's a sort of nervous excitement to it every single time and uh, you just don't know what you're going to go to sleep having seen that night so uh, for me, it, it's endlessly exciting. And, and in my experience, um, even uh, some of the people that come back to Norway with me, um, with Hertegruten, and, and have done so more than once, they also feel that sort of excitement every single time. So I like to think that's a, a universal experience. I love it, something that brings you all together. That's it, it's something we, we can all share in. It's a kind of special, um, special unique kind of wonder, uh, because if we are gonna experience the best display, that we've ever seen, then by definition, all of us will experience it together. And it's something that will bind us mm -hmm. together. I've made friends in Norway through Hertegruten that I still speak to. And we remember that night that we watched a meteor shower traveling through the Northern Lights over the mountains of Svolver or wherever we were. Those stories will stay with you forever. And that shared experience will be so unique. It's, it's almost sacred. It's something that only you and those other people will ever really understand. Uh, so it's really special. It's really special. And what obstacles might you face that regular people looking for the lights like me wouldn't know about? That's a really good question. So the first one, the obvious one, is weather. Mm -hmm. And weather can be very changeable. But just because you see clouds in the sky, it doesn't mean you won't see the northern lights. Mm -hmm. Any break in the cloud is an opportunity. But it also presents its own challenge. And this is a challenge that I discovered when I took my own parents to the Arctic to see the northern lights, which was that they couldn't tell the difference between the cloud and the aurora. And I think that's something that comes with experience. When auroras are very faint, before they pick up and become excited in the sky, they can look a lot like cloud, and, and some people may dismiss them as cloud. So that takes a little bit of training the eye to tell the difference between a cloud, which is just reflecting some light, and the aurora, which has this subtle but real self-luminous quality. But you can just tell it's not a cloud. So I think that's one of the main challenges. Another challenge is the etiquette that you face with people around you. And one of the beautiful things about traveling with Hertegruten is that everyone on that ship is there for the same reason. So when the Northern Lights are erupting, people know what to do. They know that it's not about taking flash photographs or getting in people's way, that it's about a shared experience. Mm. Um, and I think that's, that's very important because I've been to the Arctic at times and had busloads of people turn up not really knowing what to expect or how to behave, taking a bunch of photos that light up the landscape and kind of spoiling the experience. So that's another challenge. And I think that the final one is being prepared for the cold, mm -hmm. being prepared to be out and stay out in the cold. You can step inside at any time and warm up and come back out, which is fantastic. Um, but 
be prepared for the cold. You can't really overdress for it. So I think that's very important because the, the better dressed you are, the more well prepared you are, the more you will enjoy that experience and, and you won't be necessarily kind of worried about the cold. When you're guiding people on these adventures, what's one of the most common surprises you see when people are seeing the lights for the first time? What does surprise people? I know that for many people, they expect the lights to be more colourful than they appear to the eye. And that's because they've seen beautiful photographs, beautiful time lapses, even video. Mm. And cameras give us a sort of unbiased view of what the lights really do look like. So the lights are colourful, but our eyes are not good at detecting colour when the light level is low. But that doesn't mean that the colour can't appear vivid. It's just that how vivid it seems to you is quite subjective. Mm -hmm. It's like the experience of seeing anything. You can't necessarily describe that to another person. And a picture almost never does the real world justice. Mm -hmm. They also tend to be surprised by the subtlety of the motion of the lights. Okay. The lights can move very slowly at times and then very quickly at others. Mm -hmm. And it can change drastically. Again, many people will be familiar with time lapses. But of course, time lapses show us the world at a higher speed. Mm -hmm. And the lights, the real-time motion of the lights can be much slower. It can also be faster than a time-lapse. That range of motion can be absolutely extraordinary. And then finally, I think something that often surprises people as well is that it's easy to easier than one might think to take a photograph of the lights. Mm. But a photograph doesn't actually convey the experience of what you see. So when people are wanting to take photographs, my first piece of advice is always you can get very carried away with photography. Everybody wants their own photograph, they want to be able to show off, they want their bragging rights on, on Instagram to show their friends what they've yeah, done. Yeah, of course. I understand that <laughs> impulse, I do. But the best possible thing to do is to take pictures mm. here. You know, you can't share the pictures you take up here, but you can feel those pictures because they have a kind of three-dimensionality to them. They capture the environment and the landscape around you. And of course, when you look at a picture on your screen, you're not feeling the cold, you're not feeling the wind, you're not feeling the touch of the person next to you, you're not feeling that your own smile creasing your face. Um, and those are all a big part of the experience that, that take people by surprise. Those are the things they end up talking about the next day. So there are many surprising things. Um, for me, I'm always surprised as well by just how emotionally affected people are by the lights. And I think, again, that's because we live in this age of media, so we all feel like we've seen the world because we've experienced it on our social media feeds, breathtaking videos and photos and time lapses and so on. But when you're actually there, it's totally different, totally different. And so people are surprised by how emotionally affected they become because even though they can imagine seeing the lights before they travel, and even though they can explain what causes the lights, they're totally taken away by the truly unique, magical, kind of creaturely nature of this phenomenon unfolding in the sky that's completely out of reach but also feels very tangible, unlike a photograph. So uh, I find that surprising, the level of emotional um, effect that the lights have on people. And I, I sort of feel it too. I get pulled in by it um, uh, when it happens. So what exactly are we looking at when we are seeing the northern lights in the sky? So when we see the northern lights in the sky, what we're seeing is a visible expression of something that otherwise would be invisible to us. And that's what we call the space weather environment. That all starts at the sun, which is about 93 million miles away. Radiation from the sun flows all the way to the Earth, and it's intercepted by the Earth's magnetic field. We need to have the radiation and the magnetic field for this to happen, but there's one final thing we need, and we all need this one, and that's the atmosphere. Because the magnetic field focuses that radiation into the atmosphere above our heads. And when that radiation becomes very intense, it can cause the sky itself to glow. It's giving energy to the, the gas atoms in the atmosphere above us, and uh, those gas atoms give the energy back as light. Now, as the magnetic field kind of moves and waves around, it focuses that radiation into these beautiful sheets and ribbons in the sky. And sometimes when you step outside, particularly if you don't know exactly where you are or exactly where the northern lights are, you get the impression that a kind of ribbon is waving in the sky and you feel like you can reach out and touch it. It feels so close to you. But these ribbons are actually astonishingly high above your head. They reach hundreds of miles up into the atmosphere and they actually come down not even into the part of the atmosphere that we live in but actually into the part of the atmosphere that's above us so they're higher than than aircraft they're up there in the realm of, of satellites in fact 
But while those ribbons can be very big and they can stretch from horizon to horizon, they're often astonishingly thin. They can be as, as little as a few hundred meters thick, but hundreds of miles in length. So they're remarkable structures, really. Um, and the sense of what they are is hard to hold on to when you actually see them. But it's one of the great things to keep in mind because then that incredible sense of scale comes into your mind while you're watching. Thank you for your time, Tom, and thank you for watching wherever you are in the world. If you want to learn a little bit more about the Northern Lights or planning your own Aurora adventure, check out our playlist here or all of the resources that are linked in the description.